I would say historically, regardless of what we think the pace of innovation was, it was easier for institutions to keep up than it is right now. And with the advent of you know, collective learning, the tools that we have access to, you can build and deploy really extraordinary solutions in a pretty short amount of time right now. Better Innovation is hosted by Jeff Saviano, EY Global Tech's innovation leader. This isn't just about innovation. This is better innovation. All right, better innovation here with your host, Jeff Saviano. A couple of notes before we get right to today's episode. I just got back thoroughly exhausted, but excited from a week in Davos at the World Economic Forum. It is such a whirlwind in Davos, and we've decided again to bring a bunch of interviews to you from Davos with some just incredible guests. We're going to have six episodes for you in total from Davos this year. You told us last year that these were amongst your favorites, so we decided to do it again this year. So here we go, the first of six. This is a really special episode, Better Innovation, for a couple of reasons. The first is that this is our 50th episode. Can you believe it? 50 episodes. We've had so many great guests over our three seasons. And I have to say, we have great listeners, too. I hear from so many of you to keep these interviews coming. I really appreciate that support. There's nothing more than I love is to talk to the best innovators in the world and let them tell their story for you, our Better Innovation listening audience. The other reason why this episode is special for me because of our guest, Tamika Tilleman. He's such a force in the civic or social innovation community. Tamika is a diplomat, he's a technologist, and currently he's the executive director of the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative, they call that Digi, at New America, an action tank based in Washington, D.C., Tamika is the chairman of the Global Blockchain Business Council. He's a member of the World Economic Forum's Council for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. He's founded great institutions like the Blockchain Trust Accelerator and the Bretton Woods II Initiative. But in its truest sense, Tamika is a public servant. He had a very important stint in the U.S. State Department where he was a speechwriter and a senior advisor to Secretaries of State Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. This is a really special episode for me personally. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Tamika and I met a year ago at the World Economic Forum. We've remained really close this year. We're actually working together on a new exciting initiative called the Prosperity Collaborative. We're gonna to talk to you about that in this episode. I promise you're gonna love this one. Tamika Tilleman, welcome to the Better Innovation Podcast today. It's a great pleasure to be here. We are still in Davos. We've recorded a few interviews today, and as we are uh, staring out into the snow-covered Alps, this is a pretty cool place, isn't it? I hope it is the most scenic backdrop you've ever had for your podcast. If this not, is. I'm going to be disappointed. You know, that's actually a really good point, because most of the time we are in a cold and damp studio with no windows, and, and we're looking at some kind of a soundproofing equipment. So this is uh, so a slight upgrade. Very much. So. So I, I literally look over your shoulder and I can see these snow covered Alps. This is this is great, as has the week here. The week here has been such a uh, inspiring week in Davos again this year. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's been uh, exciting to see uh, a lot of work that's happened over the last year to come to fruition. Uh, and also, I think, really inspiring to see the potential for more great things on the horizon. Potential, great potential. This is our one-year anniversary where we met and, and so much has happened, which we'll talk about. I have to say, this interview has been one of the hardest for me to prepare for, <laughs> in all honesty. I, I hope not. I'm sorry to it hear that. It has been. And, and I mean it as a compliment because you have such a... Uh, a diverse background of experiences. And, and there's lots of initiatives and institutions I found. I was looking at it again this morning. You have been in, uh, involved in, in founding and leading many organizations and institutions and initiatives, and, and any one of them we could have a, a 45 minute discussion on. So we're going to try to distill the best of Tamika in it's about a, 40 minutes. It's a collection of odd jobs. So you know, we'll see what we can excavate from that. And there is lots to go through with it, but let's let's start with 
your big idea. What I love about Davos is that there are so many great ideas. You and I spend a lot of time together. What is your big idea? What's driving to Mike it today? What are you really interested in? So the biggest project that I'm working on right now, and it is an exciting, ambitious project, is a collaboration between a range of different organizations, the Rockefeller Foundation, the State Department, New York City, a bunch of jurisdictions around the world, to develop open source technical platforms to power the public sector. And what we've recognized is that there is an opportunity to create a new generation of digital public goods. We have lots of governments, lots of institutions around the world that are doing work that is very, very uh, similar. You know, it, it all, uh, if not, it not perfectly aligned, it uh, looks a lot alike, and the tasks they have to carry out are very uh, reminiscent of uh, each other. And yet, in too many instances, they are building very fractured, expensive, fragmented systems from the ground up every time they need to solve those problems. Yes. What we've seen in the private sector and in the software industry over the last couple of years is that there has been an embrace, even by a lot of historical legacy players that traditionally didn't go this route, uh, of digital public goods and, and open source tools. They've recognized that if they work together to build platforms, the outcomes are going to be far better, far higher quality, far more efficient than what they would be able to do on their own. And then they can customize the last 20 percent or so of each of those platforms to meet their specific needs. We can do the same thing in the public sector. We know this works. The only question is whether we're going to succeed in making these tools. Available. Oh, there's a lot there. There's so much we're going to have fun unpacking. You said so much that was just so important, beginning with massive problems in the world to solve, right? So we've got big problems in the world. Perhaps you've got countries that are individually trying to solve those problems. So the notion of a digital public good that is somewhat portable, and you draw the analogy to open source software, but how do you break down some of those barriers to create more digital public goods for the benefit of societies? That is the key question. And you know, what we've seen is that the infrastructure hasn't been there to do this for a variety of reasons. Part of it is a, a, a challenge for the public sector in that when something breaks, they need a phone to pick up and somebody to call who can fix that for them. And that historically has been a tough challenge to solve in the open source community. So we need to think of some new models for how to build in accountability, upgradeability, maintainability in these types of platforms. But it also is a challenge in that you know, this is a big concept. It's a big idea. And it requires a fundamentally different way of thinking about how we solve problems in the context of our institutions. And perhaps the rapid pace of technology development, perhaps that's greater than the pace of, of how we as humans and institutions are adopting those and are governing those, those technologies and are coming together to influence how societies can benefit from it. That perhaps is not moving as fast as technology is developing. Un unquestionably. And, you know, I would say historically, regardless of what we think the pace of innovation was, it was easier for institutions to keep up than it is right now. And with the advent of you know, collective learning, the, the tools that we have access to, you can build and deploy really extraordinary solutions in a pretty short amount of time right now. And you know, my friend Madeleine Albright is fond of saying that we're living in a world at the moment with institutions that were designed in the 19th century that are relying on technology that was developed in the 20th century to try and solve the challenges of the 21st century. And it's just not working so well. There's an asymmetry. Absolutely. There. And that's, uh, we're going to get into so much of that. I really want our Better Innovation audience to get to know you a little bit. You've had such a a rich history. Let's let's go back in time and would love to hear a bit to Micah about where you're from and and how you got to where you are today. Talk about where you grew up, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I, I grew up in a big, wonderful, rowdy family. Uh, rowdy. Primarily in Denver, Colorado, and a, a little bit in, in California, in the Bay Area. Uh, on weekends, when we were really well behaved, we'd get to go up into the Rockies, and it, it looked a little bit uh, like the surroundings that we find ourselves mm. in today. Uh, and, you know, I was very fortunate because uh, we had a, a big, rowdy family. Uh, everything we did, for better or worse, turned into a 
a complex multi-party negotiation. Uh, and so I think that uh, provided some early exposure to uh, the type of multi-stakeholder initiatives that I, I find myself frequently working on these days. And you're the oldest. I am the right? oldest. Uh, and, you know, the, the oldest of uh, 10 children. So it's a, a very uh, motley crew. Uh, we're, we're all very, very close. And, you know, again, I think because of the, the size of our entourage, there were always lots of challenges that required creative solutions. Uh, and so you just got uh, accustomed at a very early age to thinking differently about the circumstances you encountered, uh, because often that was what was going to be required in order to get everybody into the motel room for the night or cram <laughs> everybody into the car for vacation or whatever else it just was. Just trying to keep the peace with 10 Absolutely. kids. And as the oldest, uh, many occasions, you must have been like the third parent. <laughs> well, um, I, I certainly uh, on occasion uh, would probably be accused by my siblings of having uh, filled that role. Uh, but you know, the, the wonderful thing of uh, being in a family with a, a lot of very independent minded folks is nobody required that much uh, parroting. They, they largely uh, steered their own ships and, and that was fine. I'll bet a day doesn't go by without you giving some advice to one of the other kids in the family. And that must be fun. It uh, must be fun to come from such a big family. Well, we're fortunate today. Almost all of us live in either uh, the Washington, D.C. area or Denver, Colorado. Uh, and so we're, we're able to stay very tight. We have Sunday dinners uh, about every other week that bring people together. Oh, that's so nice. It's a wonderful community. And you've had a, uh, it, your family has a rich political history and, and your backgrounds, such uh, strong roots in the public sector. Talk a bit about um, your grandfather's work. So I was blessed in my life to have some incredible mentors and uh, certainly my, my grandfather, uh, you know, for a bunch of reasons, is uh, high on that list. Uh, he was the first Holocaust survivor ever elected to the U.S. Congress. Um, so he, he barely survived the Second World War. Most members of his family did not survive. Came to the United States with $7 and a salami. Uh, his salami was confiscated by customs when uh, he came through at Ellis what a Island. Story. And uh, you know, initially got on a train. He had received a scholarship to the University of, of Washington. And he was really confused when the train took him to Seattle instead of Washington, D.C. Um, but you know, worked very, very hard, uh, sent all of his spare money back to the few relatives that he still had in Hungary, eventually married his childhood sweetheart in the United States, became a college professor teaching economics, and served 30 years in Congress, the, the latter part of which was as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. So House Foreign Affairs Committee, and he, so he was out on the West Coast, he stayed out in the in the Washington State area? He stayed uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So he represented the southern part of San Francisco and, and the peninsula. And um, you know, he, throughout his career, in part because I think the experience that he had had growing up, was keenly aware of the fact that uh, you know, his, his quote that he impressed on my mind many times is that the veneer of civilization is paper thin and the institutions that we rely on uh, are much more fragile than they might appear. Uh, so he instilled in all of us a real commitment to try and fix those institutions, make them work better, uh, mm. make them serve the needs of people more efficiently. And uh, you know, hopefully if, if we do that, we can ensure that fewer people around the world will have to go through the type of uh, turmoil and trauma that he endured as a, a young boy. What a wonderful sentiment that quote is. And, and you also share with me as we were getting ready for today that that used to used to carry his bags a bit. And as a kid, you would travel around with him when he was a congressman. And uh, I'd love to hear a story about that. That must have been exciting for you as a kid to do that. Well, you know, he had um, almost, as I mentioned, his entire family wiped out. And when I was born, uh, I was the first grandchild. He had two daughters. So I was the, the first time he'd had uh, a little boy to play with. Uh, and I think in part because of that, he was very keen to keep me close. And so uh, he would use his frequent flyer miles to let me travel with him uh, whenever the opportunity arose. Uh, and I was very fortunate to sit with him in a lot of meetings that he held with government leaders around the world. Uh, I remember one time we were sitting down with one of the uh, the top leaders in, in China's government, uh, and he came in a little bit sheepish. He said, I have to apologize for my intelligence. I had heard that Congressman Lantos's grandson was going to be with him. And by this time, uh, I think I was uh, in my early 20s. And so I had uh, prepared some gifts, and he handed me a collection of children's toys <laughs> at the time. 
Um, so I'm, I'm sure his intelligence uh, has improved uh, that's since a funny then. funny story. Uh, but we had some, some good times together. His name was Congressman Tom Lantos. That's correct. That's right. And your grandmother was also involved in politics. Very much so. On uh, the other side of my family, uh, my dad's mother was the first female lieutenant governor uh, in Colorado. Uh, and so when I was a, a very, very young child, just a couple of weeks old, uh, I attended her inauguration. And uh, you know, I have fond memories as a, a little kid of going to visit her in Colorado's Gold Dome capital. Um, so it was a, a wonderful you know, schoolhouse of sorts, both in Washington and in Denver, uh, to be able to gain exposure to how policy is made and, and the responsibility uh, that leaders have uh, to look after the interests of citizens. It had to have influenced you, and it's of, it, knowing you and, and the work that you've done, and we'll talk more about some of the great positions and responsibilities that you've had look back on the influence of your grandfather and your grandmother and others in your family, it had to have influenced you with the work that you do today. I certainly hope so uh, in, in some regards. You know, my, my grandparents uh, on, on both sides were kind of unique. I don't think they uh, make them uh, that way anymore. That's probably true um, for that but, generation. You know, they, they were deeply committed to public service. Uh, you know, none of them ever uh, uh, took many of the, the diversions that uh, a lot of our public servants and former public servants end up taking uh, in uh, the world today. They were very, very committed uh, to trying to strengthen human rights and democracy, improve governance, uh, and look after the needs of the constituents that they were fortunate to serve. It has been really impressive to, as we were getting ready for today, to see the different institutions that you've been involved in. As I mentioned at the outset, that I look across your body of work and across those institutions, and, and it's not just the launching of them, but really accomplishing quite a bit. So we won't have time to get into all of them, but there are some that, that I really found fascinating. Maybe the first because of the grandiosity of the name of Bretton Woods II, and and how important that initiative was. Tamika, talk a bit about what Bretton Woods II was about. Sure. So this is a body of work that I began immediately after leaving the State Department. And what I recognized at that point, and it's uh, intricately related to the work that we're doing now on tax, is that we had a whole lot of problems on the planet, and very rarely were there enough resources available uh, to address those challenges. And so one of the things that I spent a lot of time thinking about is what are the types of business models that could be created uh, that would align the resources that exist on the planet with the challenges that we need to address. Uh, and spent a lot of time looking at the world's largest asset holders, uh, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds that collectively, even if you count conservatively, control about $30 trillion. And we looked at how those organizations, which have very, very long generational time horizons, are considering social governance and environmental factors uh, in their investment strategies. And it turned out at that point, you know, five years ago, very, very few of them were. This was just not something that featured right. at all in the way they put their money to work in the world. And so we, as I left the State Department, I, I found some amazing partners that had deep expertise in this field, uh, shared a concern about these issues, uh, and, and we set to work. So we created an index that tracks about $20 trillion worth of capital and uh, charts the uh, organizations that have custody of these funds relative to their peers uh, and lets them know who does a good job of thinking about social governance and environmental mm. factors, who does a bad job. Uh, and then you know, my key partner in this, Scott Kalb, who was previously chief investment officer of South Korea's Sovereign Wealth Fund, and I uh, have started holding convenings around the world. The thinking was to go back to the Bretton Woods II name, uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, leaders came together at a place called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire uh, because they realized that we had just witnessed the violent collapse of civilization, and they wanted to build financial institutions that could help prevent that from happening again. And you know, what we have seen, I think, in the last uh, few years is that we, again, are at a very frankly, sensitive and dangerous moment in, in history when we're facing some big problems and we need to reimagine financial architecture to solve those challenges. Fortunately, as we have engaged in this work and, and convened these actors, we've seen a pretty dramatic shift in behavior. Mm. Many of these large asset allocators now have very strong strategies for addressing these types of risks, and it has moved the needle in a, a very demonstrable and concrete way. 
And it must be very encouraging to you, to Mike. It's, a, it's, it's here in the you know, 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum that you know, there's a recent movement for the largest corporate institutions to come together in solidarity, shining a light on corporate responsibility and the disclosures of what those organizations are doing for the better of betterment of society. And so it must be very encouraging for you to see that happening now here, too. Absolutely. And, you know, capital flows downhill. These large pension funds and sovereign funds are kind of the headwaters of the global financial system. Right. As they have started to pay more attention to these issues, we've seen corporates come on board in a, a really exciting way. So we renamed the Bretton Woods II uh, project a little while ago as the Responsible Asset Allocator Initiative. And uh, we're excited to see a lot of the principles that we pioneered in that work uh, percolating really nicely through some of these uh, initiatives that you mentioned uh, that are very prominent here today. And great to launch under the name Bretton Woods, too. Of course, you, uh, it's impossible not to think of Bretton Woods. And, and I happen to live in that corner of the world and uh, have spent time at that Mount Washington Hotel where uh, so many of the important gatherings had occurred. And I don't think many people understand the importance of those meetings and importance of Bretton Woods and, and the accord that came out of that. Well, ultimately, you know, I think what... Uh we have recognized in, in the course of our work is that unless good people come together to address these challenges, they don't get solved. And uh, that was very much the, the mindset that we brought to our engagement on that topic and our work on digital governance. And you know, the, the encouraging side of this is that just as we saw the, the World Bank and an array of assorted uh, related institutions emerge from Bretton Woods, we're seeing new solutions emerge again today. Mm. And it's a, a privilege to be part of the, the story that goes along with the creation of that new architecture. That came after your work at the State Department. And we've had great discussions about uh, your uh, role as a speechwriter for Secretaries of State Kerry and Clinton. Talk a bit about your role as a speechwriter and how that work was important to you at the time. Well, it was not a job that I ever anticipated holding. Uh, and I had worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for a number of years under John Kerry, Barack Obama, and, and Joe Biden primarily. And uh, after the 2008 election, uh, got a call and uh, I was asked whether I would come over and be a speechwriter for Secretary Clinton. Uh, I was very unsure about whether I wanted to take the position. I had no experience at the time in writing speeches for anybody else, did uh, you? E exactly. I'd always been a, a policy guy that would dabble a little bit in speechwriting on the side, but I wouldn't have described it in, in any respect as a core competency. And talked eventually to a, a friend of mine who had been uh, the speechwriter for another Secretary of State. And I, I asked him, and he'd written for Henry Kissinger, is this a job that I want to do? And he said, absolutely, don't look back. This is one of the best chances you will ever have uh, to see policy being made and to shape that process. Uh, and you know, through about 200 speeches that I collaborated on together with Secretary Clinton, I had that chance every single day. So it was a, an amazing thing to take in a wide array of different views that exist within the, the U.S. Right. government. Uh, and we often think of, of government as a monolithic structure. It is absolutely not. Uh, you know, I've heard it said that government is a plural noun, uh, and, mm. and we really like need that. to uh, think of it in those terms. Uh, but then to try to distill down those ideas into something that would represent the, the values of the United States and advance our interests in the world. Just the volume is staggering. 200 speeches, and you were in that job for about a year and a half or yeah. so? Do I have that right? So the volume and the number, there's one story I, I just have to say, we talked a bit about it earlier, that in one of the released emails from Hillary Clinton, there was a reference that you went almost 100 hours without going to bed because you wanted to finish a key speech on Internet freedom. That must have been a really high stakes speech. Well, it was the first time that any senior official in the U.S. government had spoken about this new subject. Oh, and fascinating. I, I realize yeah. I'm dating myself in, in saying that, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago uh, that she delivered that speech. Uh, and at the time, it was uncharted territory. Hmm. So we had 50 different agencies and offices across the U.S. government uh, come together for the review of that speech. Uh, the writing was relatively easy by comparison. It, it is one of my favorite speeches that I worked on in that time. But trying to manage all of the competing bureaucratic interests to, to get that speech over the finish line uh, was a bit of a Herculean task. So I'm glad that I made it through 
and uh, I was also glad to go to bed when it was all done. <laughs> what a great experience for you, and what a great job to have, and having the pleasure of working with you pretty closely over this past year. I have to say that you have a gift for synthesizing a message into its most salient points and then finding the way to communicate that effectively. That year and a half must influence the work that you do today and the ability to understand a message and craft it and then communicate it to be most effective. It had to have influenced that. Well, I think what I came to recognize is that we as a species are hardwired to understand the world through stories. You know, we, we think about, I have, right. a, I have a bunch of kids, uh, you, you think about the time that you spend with them, you know, hopefully uh, in, in the evenings, we spend that time on storytelling. You know, we, we teach our children through stories, we grow up understanding things uh, through the power of storytelling. Uh, and that's not something that I really was cognizant of prior to uh, serving in that role. Uh, and so I've tried as best I'm able to carry that into work on what I realize are really complex, cumbersome subjects. And, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of the change that needs to happen in the world is related to really complex, dense, cumbersome subjects. But if you can, and I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in this by any stretch, but to the extent we can make those complicated ideas a little bit more readily understandable, uh, if we can frame them in terms of stories that resonate with people in their daily mm -hmm. lives, then hopefully yeah. we're going to have a, an easier time changing minds and along with that changing behavior. And ultimately, that's what's required to address these challenges. The importance of the narrative arc and, and in any story that there's a protagonist and you want to root for somebody, there's somebody worth rooting for. There's a cause that, that um, the, in the hero's journey that the hero is uh, trying to achieve something that's significant. And I think about what we'll, we'll talk a bit later about the work that we're doing in the tax area. You know, tax in and of itself without context is is perhaps not the most exciting um, uh, fields no, and no. issues to talk about. I know that's like a sacrilege, right? But you know, you've helped us in a way to talk about it that it humanizes it and the importance of it for society. So that I just find it so interesting that that the work that you have done as a speechwriter and what that must have been to crank out two hundred of them and to have uh, influence from many different places. What that means to your work today. You came out of that role and and you stayed within the State Department, there was a unique position that was formed for you. Talk a bit about what you did after your job as a speechwriter. Well, Secretary Clinton took me aside one day and it was uh, after we had just done a, a big speech together on uh, the future of governance and the future of democracy. And she said, look, we've got a problem. The world is changing far more quickly than the institution of the State Department. And unless and until we're able to design new initiatives and, and new architecture uh, as part of this agency to keep up with that, we're going to be in real trouble. You know, if you think about the, the time that the modern State Department took form, it was in the aftermath of, of World War II when everything that uh, the United States cared about, with very few exceptions, was a government-to-government -government challenge. And you, know, you and I have chatted about this before, but today there is hardly an issue that is worth addressing that can be solved by governments alone. Uh, and so we needed to create new infrastructure that would bring civil society, the private sector, non-state actors into the work of the department. And we also needed to, to think hard about how we renovate a lot of calcified institutions that weren't meeting the needs of citizens around the world. Uh, so I had what was probably the best job in Washington. I led mm. a team that operated a little bit like a venture capital fund, and our job was to find great ideas for uh, solving those types of challenges. And then we would bring together tech talent resources and partners uh, to deliver uh, what we hope uh, would be really uh, good wins for the United States and, uh, and the Secretary of State and the President. And we certainly see that in your work today. We just had a conversation about the need to collaborate and decision making with an ecosystem. And it seems as though this came out of a need that Secretary Clinton saw in the world. And to give her the credit that she saw problems in the world and problems that the U.S. was having, but how others could benefit as well. And perhaps a new approach to tackling those big issues. Is that is that fair? Very much so. And, you know, I, I think we've all come to recognize in, in the last couple of years uh, that 
the world's governments aren't quite keeping pace with uh, you know, everything else that's happening out there. And uh, you know, I think it's a collective responsibility that we all have. Nobody else is going to fix this for us. All of us as citizens need to, yeah. to own that fact and, and do what we can to, to make that problem better. But what a great role of government. Isn't that um, a laudable role of government and, and for Secretary Clinton to see that need in the world and also to see your skills and capabilities and match those two together and and to try a new approach. And and maybe now to fast forward a bit, I'm also really curious about your work in uh, something called the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative, Digi, as part of New America. Could you talk a bit about your role as executive director of that initiative? Absolutely. So this goes back to the, the big idea that we started with. Uh, we have recognized in the course of a lot of our work on, on blockchain and advanced technologies that there are better ways to power the public sector. There are better ways for institutions to meet the needs of the, the citizens that they have the uh, very great responsibility to serve. And uh, you know, if, if creating those solutions were easy, it would have happened a long time ago. It hasn't. Uh, but, you know, it's up to us and it's up to the organizations that we collaborate with uh, to try and create those new ways of doing business. We right now are building what we refer to as 80 percent solutions. Uh, so our goal is to develop platforms that address critical needs of governments all over the world. Uh, in many instances, those are governments in the United States uh, and, and they'll be big state governments or big cities like New York City or uh, New Jersey. And in many instances, uh, these are jurisdictions around the planet. Uh, we have five platforms that we are uh, right now working on in, in varying stages of development. Uh, and our goal is to deliver extremely high quality 80% solutions and then let governments customize and optimize the last 20% of the solution to meet their specific needs. And they would do that with input, I'm sure, from the private sector and other places. But you're, you're very focused on the core, on that core asset, the 80% that perhaps could be portable. Think of it like an open source, right, an open source initiative that can cut across different governments and institutions. And, and then the customization that would have to happen for that last mile. Absolutely. And, and to your earlier point, this is work that can't be done without the engagement of the private sector and, and civil society. Uh, and they both bring really important expertise to the table. Uh, in, in our partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation on these uh, efforts, uh, they often uh, refer to our team as kind of the general contractor. Uh, and, and our job is to bring together these, these different constituencies that have really deep expertise in a specific area and try to leverage that expertise to, to address these bigger challenges. What's an example of a technology project that has come out of this initiative that would be good for our audience as they think about the context of, um, just as the words say, of the name of the initiative, Digital Impact Governance Initiative, focused on that core 80%. Give us an example of something that you're working on. So this last week, the governor of New Jersey announced uh, one of the projects that we've been collaborating on in his State of the State address. Uh, it's called NJ Jobs. And it's a platform that we have been developing together to make it easier for citizens in that state, uh, especially those that are experiencing long-term unemployment, uh, to get connected with the opportunities and the resources they need to find uh, you know, gainful employment and, and opportunities professionally. We think that you know, benefits and, and employment are one example of the, the work that we can do together, uh, but we see a lot of related uh, initiatives. We're working in some jurisdictions to create data wallets that will make it easier for citizens to validate their eligibility for city services. Uh, we're working in other cases to make it easier uh, to move resources transparently and accountably uh, between institutions so that you don't have challenges with corruption and you can simplify auditing and related tasks. So there are a whole host mm. of different responsibilities that governments have that just aren't being carried out very well right now. And, and if we can fix those and, and make it easier for citizens to gain access to the raw material that they need to build a firm foundation for their lives, then that's a big win from our standpoint. I've been really interested lately in an innovation theory that came out of Harvard Business School uh, it's called Jobs to be Done Theory and came out of Clayton Christensen's work, who is the grandfather of disruptive innovation theory. And what I love about the theory is that it really focuses on the specific 
jobs to be done? What are the unmet needs that exist around a particular problem? And I was really struck by, as I was reading a bit about, and you and I have talked a bit about Digi and this, this digital impact governance initiative, is that you're getting to the heart of that governments, whether it's at the national, subnational, or local level, they have specific jobs to be done. They have needs that are unmet before this initiative came around. Talk a bit about some of the barriers that existed that prevented them from really addressing those jobs to be done. Well, I think there are a couple of market failures. And uh, you know, what uh, we have seen is that first, very, very few governments have the technical expertise required uh, to build these types of solutions on their own. So even if you have a visionary leader who has the big picture and wants to do the right thing, it's not easy for them to identify the, the talent in-house to make this stuff happen. That is compounded by the fact that very few of these uh, institutions have resources lying around to invest in these types of long-term solutions. And so what we try to do is solve for those market failures. We try to mobilize philanthropic capital and great private sector partners like EY who can help us make long-term strategic investments that will provide digital public goods to fix some of these problems. And at the same time, we work to develop the knowledge base, the research, uh, the expertise that will enable public servants and those in positions of responsibility to better put uh, these pieces together. They, they need uh, effectively a blueprint for how they can assemble these technologies into tools that are going to serve citizens more efficiently. And, and those are really the areas where we try to invest our energy. And as you said at the outset to Micah, that, that they may not have the technical abilities within government to tackle those problems on their own. What we've found is that perhaps they don't even have the capabilities to write an RFP to hire somebody to perform the functions for them. And, and we've found that, that especially what's so interesting to us and exciting about this work is that it provides that governance layer and that assistance and the advice to governments to frame the problem in a way and to search for solution providers. And as you said, to provide that core that you know, we've found in our work and across this industry that, that just formulating an RFP and formulating the problem and what the needs are, that's a hugely important first step. And you're providing such a valued service here. Well, we're, we're doing our best. And you know, what we have seen is that if you look around the world, there are only a very small handful of uh, jurisdictions that have really gotten this right. And you can pretty much count them on one hand. Yeah. Uh, but places like Estonia, places like Singapore, increasingly India, have developed a really comprehensive systems level approach to solving these challenges. But that's not the way that most of our agencies and institutions operate. They operate within silos. They have very narrow tasks that they're trying to accomplish. And unless and until you can zoom back and take in that big picture, you're not going to emerge with an optimal solution. Well, and, and that's yeah. part of our job is to help governments do that. And as you said earlier, too, that the more complex problems that we have and really requires looking at this in different ways. You mentioned Estonia in season two, I believe, of our podcast. We have Anders Kutt, who uh, was on our uh, podcast, and uh, he was essentially the chief technology officer within the country. And it was a really uh, um, a fascinating discussion about how a relatively small nation could make giant leaps. And essentially, they've created a digital sandbox from our perspective, tax perspective, they're, they're using blockchain to manage VAT outside of tax. They've got all their digital health records on a blockchain. They voted through a blockchain as well. And just to hear how you had an openness in government and I think a trust of the citizenry that they saw some of the benefits from. So how do you take learnings from those sandbox environments in Estonia and then parachuted into a state like New Jersey to achieve some benefits. That's well, not easy. It's not. And, and you know what we've seen in both Estonia and Singapore is that they have very, very tightly integrated, well-designed government stacks. Uh, they've been built from the ground up uh, around a, a vision. They knew what they wanted to accomplish, and they were able to move the entire government uh, to achieve that vision. That is not something that is likely to happen in many other places. 
And so one of the lessons that we have uh, incorporated from studying those uh, examples in pretty great detail is that a lot of these solutions are going to have to be a bit modular. You're not going to have circumstances where you're going to be able to deploy everything all at the same time in sequence. And so we need to build uh, platforms that can work a little bit more like Legos and can be assembled hmm. by dif different jurisdictions in different ways to meet their specific needs. I think it's such an important point. just want to focus on this for a minute for our listening audience that perhaps prior to this discussion, they may think of government as technology needs, like any institution, right? It could be the private sector. In the public sector, talking about a governmental unit or an agency or an entire national or subnational government, they have technology needs. I'll bet most people thought that they would meet them one of two ways. They would either, as you said earlier, Tamika, they would, number one, they would hire the computer scientists and engineers and they would build the technology or they would issue an RFP and they would hire a third party provider to come in and to solve it. That's not what you're suggesting. You're suggesting that there's a third option. And, and I just think that it's such a portable idea, maybe is the, the best way that I can say it. What you have described, this new model for bringing technology to solve a complex problem, is a third model that I don't think many in our audience realized was existing in the world today. Well, you know, all I would say is they've got a lot of good company. Uh, this is not a concept that has... Uh, been floating out there for a long time. This is pretty recent That's fair. in, yeah. in um, origin, and I think it's only in the last couple of years, first, that the technology has evolved to a point where uh, a lot of this is, is really feasible, and, and we can talk about doing this at scale with extremely secure solutions that can meet the needs of an entire population, and also that the thinking around, you know, for lack of a better term, the business models has evolved to a point uh, where we've seen uh, governments start to get comfortable with this concept. But we're getting there, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we're at a really... A uh, key inflection point in the story of this innovation, uh, where it's starting to move very quickly. And we find this in our work as well in our advanced technology lab at EY. Our computer scientists and engineers, to make it hate when I say this, but to some extent, the technology is not as complicated as the governance and the business model necessities that are around it. And I look at, at the most complicated questions that we're wrestling with. Uh, you know, one in particular is there's a, a blockchain solution for a particular tax need that we know would benefit dozens and dozens of governments and hundreds and thousands of private enterprises, getting them all to agree on features and functions and the model for how it can be built and utilized by many is a hugely complicated question. I have a, a good friend who says the technology is the easy part uh, on these things. Uh, and there is some truth in that. Uh, what is much more challenging is aligning the different stakeholders uh, in ways where they see the benefits in undertaking, you know, as we've talked about earlier, uh, the investment in the uncommon coalitions that can deliver these wins. Uh, and you know, that is not a simple task, but it's also no, it's not. immensely rewarding and impactful when you get it right. You covered some of this yesterday in a panel that you moderate. Talk a bit about the governance panel that you led as part of the Global Blockchain Business Council. Well, you know, what we have uh, recognized and we've alluded to it in this conversation is that we've reached a bit of a turning point in the story of humanity in which it is now much more challenging to govern the things that we create than it is to create them. And so we need to develop new models, we need to develop new solutions that are going to help institutions that have been around for a long time keep up uh, and, and serve the needs of citizens more efficiently. Uh, we were fortunate yesterday to have some of the very best thinkers in the world on these themes uh, come together and have a, an amazing conversation, and it was a, a privilege for me to moderate that discussion. But what we're finding as, as we uh, engage with leaders in the public sector, leaders in the technology community, leaders in civil society, is that we all recognize there's a better way of solving these challenges. And uh, I think we're getting closer to realizing that at scale. I think it's a real theme coming out of Davos this year, Tamika, is that this recognition of the high stakes and complexities of technology governance. I don't think many in the technology community, whether it's, again, going always think about our listening audience, the better innovation audience that they think of how they're using technology within the private sector or for those in the public sector, 
but this issue around how technology is governed. What does it mean to govern technology? Well, it's a, a really important question, and I would argue that it may be the fundamental question uh, of our time. We have a lot of tools, a lot of platforms that have popped up over the last few decades. In most instances, that evolution uh, has occurred in the absence of any real oversight from legal authorities. It's occurred in the absence of a lot of oversight from citizens. And you know, sadly, we're now reaping the consequences of that. We're seeing that in many cases, uh, individuals' privacy has been, been violated. Uh, we have platforms that are changing our behavior without us being mindful of the fact that they're changing our behavior. Mm, well said. And, and not always in ways that are beneficial to society as a whole. In fact, in many instances, it's pretty damaging to society as a sure whole. Sure is, yeah. So I think there is a, a moment, for lack of a, a better techie term, to hit the reset button and think about how we are going to build in a layer of accountability, a layer of responsibility to the technology tools and platforms that increasingly are defining very large swaths of our lives. And unless and until we get deliberate about that task, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't like the consequences. Uh, this is something that's going to demand yeah. a very serious investment of energy and intellect in order to, to land all of us in a better place. And we can talk about it in terms of technology governance. I think even there's perhaps a subset of technology governance around the governance of data. And you mentioned you know, issues around cybersecurity and the hypersensitivity that we all have as citizens to, especially now where we stand today, January 2020, the hypersensitivity of, of citizens all around the world to who owns my data, do I own it, does somebody else have access to it, how is the data governed, how are institutions utilizing that data, and you know, just that alone we can look out over the next two years or so, or even shorter period, I think the next year, there's going to be an explosion of regulatory attention around data governance and as a, as a component of technology. So these are important questions in the world. Absolutely. And you know, again, without getting too far into the, the geopolitical dimensions of this, we've seen some countries in the last few years develop models for fusing data technology and government in ways that allow authorities to know more about any individual in right. their society than past governments would have known, or they would know more about every individual in their society than past governments would have known about any individual in their society. And that has a lot of potentially problematic ramifications. And uh, you know what we have seen in the, the last few years is that Western leaders have started to raise concerns about that. What they haven't done is offered a real alternative. And we need to get very serious about developing alternatives that respect the rights of citizens, that respect fundamental principles of privacy and accountability, and still enable us to realize the vast benefits uh, of these te technologies. Before we end our conversation today, we have to talk about the Prosperity Collaborative, and it has been uh, it's been wonderful this past year to work on this with, with you, with New America. We talk about the great collaboration that has already happened with the parties, EY and New America and MIT, uh, the World Bank and Boston Global Forum. There has been great collaboration that has occurred and there'll be even greater collaboration that will occur. Talk a bit about what is the Prosperity Collaborative meant to you and why are you so interested in taxes and the intersection of taxes with your work? Well, the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote that taxes are the price we pay for living in a civilized society. And at a moment when, to use my grandfather's term, the veneer of civilization is wearing pretty thin, uh, I think it's important to go back and, and look at the investments that we are making uh, in public finance and, and in taxation in particular. Uh, if you were able to capture the resources uh, that uh, should be flowing into the public sector, if our tax systems were working properly, and if we were able to address the, the challenges of corruption along with that, we would be able to fund the entirety of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That's everything from climate change to the eradication of extreme poverty to fixing our oceans, you name it. So 
this is really, really fundamentally important to just about every issue that certainly brings people together here in Davos at, at the World Economic Forum, but also issues that we care about and wrestle with in our daily lives. So this, uh, in, in terms of something that should matter, it's tough to find something that's a lot higher on the list than this. I, I think this is really foundational and fundamental. Beyond that, if we get this right, if we do a better job of fairly and efficiently get moving resources into the public sector, leveling the playing field for individuals and corporations, and then creating accountability and transparency around how those resources are used once they're into the public sector, we can, I believe, renew the social contract between citizens and the state that is fraying very thin at the moment. And so I, I think this project, while, you know, again, taxes may not be uh, the most exotic or exciting oh, topic on, on the planet in, in the minds of some people, I think it goes to the core of many of yeah. the biggest challenges that we are wrestling with in our societies. Just think about the magnitude of what you said about funding the sustainable development goals. And it struck me from being part of, of uh, this great Davos sessions the past couple of days is that there's so much attention on funding the SDGs. And really, so much of it is about reallocating expenses and expenditures within government. Government is spending money on X, and we think it should take some of that funding and it should shift it to support the SDGs. That's not what we're talking about, is it? Well, I think it is a much bigger vision. Than I that. agree. And, and you know, again, if we do this right, and there's no guarantee we're going to be able to get it right, but if we're able to do this right, uh, then we're able to you know, expand the uh, stake that citizens have in the way that public funds are, are deployed uh, and give them a greater appreciation of uh, and an understanding of how these resources can be used to, to benefit them and their families. And, you know, if, we, if you get that right, um, there's a, a great term that you have taught me called tax morale. People have a, a lot more uh, confidence in uh, the way that their money is being spent. And I think you see a, a reimagining, ideally, uh, of what it means for citizens to partner with the public sector uh, in addressing these these big common challenges that we face as societies. We need the, and we, we discussed it a bit earlier, that solving problems collaboratively. We need the best computer scientists. We need artificial intelligence systems. We need advancement with blockchain. We need policy specialists. We need innovation support. We need regulatory assistance. All of that together and building those coalitions and how important that is. One of the, the uh, objectives we talked about on the panel when we discussed the work that we've been doing together with the other parties that we mentioned one of the things we discussed yesterday on the panel was just imagine if we could save 1%, just 1% of global tax fraud around the world, that would mean fusing 30 plus billion dollars of new capital a year into government coffers to do a lot of good in the world. And, and I think that got a, a nice response from the audience we had yesterday. Absolutely. I mean, you think about the amount of wailing and gnashing of teeth <laughs> uh, that uh, goes into mobilizing much, much smaller sums of money to solve challenges that we encounter in the world. Here we have a chance if we fix the underlying rails that we're, we're operating on, the underlying infrastructure, uh, to do something that is almost unprecedented in scale uh, and is going to have benefits in every single country on the planet. Well said. Well said. There's important work to do, and I'm excited to do it with you and, and the others that we've been collaborating with. And it's been a great year leading up to this point, and it was so, so much fun to, to tell the world about it yesterday. Well, it's been a great privilege. Okay, you've made it this far. Are you ready for, at the end of our Better Innovation podcast, we have three rapid-fire questions, quick questions, quick answers. You ready? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. What book do you have on your nightstand? Uh, so this is uh, too hard to answer with one. I'm, I'm going to give two baskets of answers. One is anything by Clay Christensen, and, and you brought him up uh, earlier oh, in our podcast. Great, yeah. Uh, and the second is because I'm a, a dad, an amazing book, uh, called I'm Just No Good at Rhyming by Chris Harris, uh, which is a collection of the best bedtime uh, limericks and rhymes for kids that I've ever encountered. Mm. Uh, and we, we read that book almost every evening in my house. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I really, that's great. Many in our audience will really appreciate that. It reminds me and uh, the, the collection of those two works that 
There's a great book, The Letters from Teddy Roosevelt to His Kids, which I think is, is, uh, is still one of my favorite. And Clayton Christensen's work is amazing. It, the Innovative Dilemma is the innovation bible. Certainly. Okay, you're doing great. Two more. Who do you follow on social media? Um, so here, again, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I'm going to have to say uh, the Global Blockchain Business Council uh, and then our brand new, and I would encourage your listeners to, uh, to engage with it, Digi at New America, a social media account uh, that's pumping out uh, a lot of great information on the work. I now follow that, too, and there is. There's lots of information yeah. coming through there. Last question. Tell us about one really cool innovation that's made an impact on you and your personal life. Something lately that maybe you just can't live without or something cool that our audience may appreciate. Well, you know, the, this is, again, perhaps a predictable answer, but I've been really inspired by the power and potential of distributed technologies to address fundamental issues like identification, digital identity, bringing people into uh, the financial sector, uh, giving them access to economic opportunity, giving them access to public services. We're seeing those solutions start to take flight in a lot of the platforms that we're building. And you know, we are in the very, very early stages of, of this process. Uh, this is the, you know, the, the opening innings of the game, but we can see where it's headed and it's exciting and inspiring. You believe in the promise of distributed Absolutely. technology. It will happen. Absolutely. It's just, it's just a matter of time. Tamika, this has been such great fun, and I've really appreciated this past year. It's been so much fun to get to know you and to do some real work together. As you said at best, there is so much good in the world that these institutions can do together. I just want to thank you for your interest in collaborating and the support that you're provided with this Prosperity Collaborative, and looking forward to doing lots of great work together. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. This work is not for the faint of heart, and it's been an incredible privilege to collaborate with you and your team as we've walked this path, and we're really excited about uh, the work that lies ahead in the coming year. Thank you so much. This has been Better Innovation from EY. Let us know what you think about the show by leaving a review or by reaching out to Jeff at jeffrey.saviano at ey.com or find him on Twitter at Jeffrey Saviano. Better Innovation is produced by the great team at Hogarth Worldwide.